which is part of Trinity's 21st annual Green Week, which we're celebrating with great pride this week. Um, I'm Catherine Darker. I'm one of the professors in the School of Medicine. Um, and I'll be chairing today's session. As you've probably noticed, we are recording this session because there's some delegates who weren't able to uh, attend the live session. So I hope everyone's okay with it being recorded. We're delighted to have Professor Tony Kapan, direct from the Monash Sustainability Development Institute in Australia. Uh, Tony holds a chair in planetary health in the School of Public Health and Preventative Medicine at Monash University. Tony's a public health physician by background training. He's also a, a recognized authority in environmental health and health promotion. His research focuses on urbanization, sustainable development and human health. So he's very well placed to talk to us today about a healthy people, healthy planet. Tony is a former director of the International Institute for Global Health at the United Nations University and has previously held professorial appointments at the University of Sydney and Australian National University. He's a member of the Rockefeller Foundation, Lancet Commission on Planetary Health, that published its report, Safeguarding Human Health, uh, in 2015, and the International Advisory Board for the Lancet Planetary Health. We're absolutely delighted that Tony has um, agreed to present uh, today. Um, it's, I think, eight o'clock uh, at night in Australia for Tony. So it, it's great to have made that effort, Tony. We really deeply appreciate it. Um, so uh, thank you very much. And I'll hand over to you, Tony. Look, thanks very much, Catherine, and terrific to be with you all today. Let me... Uh, just share the slide deck. I'm just going to share the sound at the same time um, and put it into the mode. Uh, can you? That's coming through, Catherine. You can see that. Yeah. Yes, perfectly. Thank you very much. So, as I said, uh, terrific to be with you all today uh, as part of Trinity College's Green Week. And my topic is healthy planet, healthy people. I'll speak probably for about 40 minutes or so, and then we can have some Q&A. So, so do think about questions. I think potentially you could post them in the Q&A box or um, just raise them uh, at the end. As I begin, I'd like to acknowledge the traditional owners of the land I'm on today here in Melbourne. Uh, it's a uh, Wurundjeri country, uh, people of the Kulin Nation. And uh, uh, I acknowledge traditional owners uh, wherever we're assembling today uh, around the world, in Ireland and beyond. And uh, we'll talk a little bit more about this as I proceed uh, through the talk, because uh, traditional knowledge, Indigenous knowledge, it can be really valuable uh, in grappling uh, with these big planetary health challenges that we face. Today, I'd like to begin with some images from the 2019-2020 bushfires here in Australia. This image uh, from Malakuta in far eastern Victoria, people sheltering from the bushfires on a beach. Here, an image from Sydney. You can just make out uh, the Opera House and the Harbour Bridge there uh, from quite a, a, a distance there. And Sydney was shrouded uh, in smoke for months. Uh, during that devastating uh, bushfire season. And here, uh, an image from Australian Parliament House in Canberra. You can see people wearing masks uh, to protect themselves from the bushfire smoke before we were regularly uh, wearing masks uh, to perfect, protect ourselves uh, in the context of the pandemic. And here were the headlines uh, from all around the world uh, that summer. Those bushfires made clear to us all that our climate has changed 
and it's already harming the health of people and many other species around the world. In that particular fire season, it was estimated that more than 3 billion animals died in Australia. The rains came at the end of that season, and within weeks, uh, we were grappling with the COVID-19 pandemic around the world. And I begin with this because those bushfires and this pandemic are symptoms of what we now call the Anthropocene. They're signs that the way we live is out of balance with nature. In this talk, I'd like to do five things. First, reflect on some history that's relevant. Uh, make sure we're all on the same page with the idea of the Anthropocene. And then talk to uh, findings from the Rockefeller Foundation, Lancet Commission on Planetary Health. And then broaden out uh, thinking ecologically about human health. And finally, so what? What does all this mean for uh, the way we do things? So the Anthropocene Epoch, you can see here on this slide, uh, a link uh, to the animation I'm about to show. Um, our Earth science colleagues arguing that we're leaving the Holocene Epoch and entering a new epoch. They, they've coined the term uh, the Anthropocene Epoch, uh, the Epoch of Humanity, uh, now that collectively we're changing Earth systems to such an extent that it'll be seen in the fossil record on Earth uh, in years to come. So let's watch this uh, three-minute animation together. This is the story of how one species changed a planet. The latest chapter of our story begins in England 250 years ago. Fueled by coal, then oil, several brilliant inventions appeared. They ignited the Industrial Revolution, which spread like wildfire through Europe, North America, Japan, then elsewhere. The great railways, then cars and highways, connected people across the globe. Medical discoveries saved millions of lives. New artificial fertilizers meant we could feed more people. Population rose rapidly. But this was nothing compared with what was to come. The 1950s marked the beginning of the Great Acceleration. Globalization, marketing, tourism, and huge investments helped fuel enormous growth. People swarmed to cities, which became even more powerful engines of creativity. In a single lifetime, the well-being of millions has improved beyond measure. Health, wealth, security, longevity, never have so many had so much. Yet one billion are malnourished. In a single lifetime, we have grown into a phenomenal global force. We move more sediment and rock annually than all natural processes, such as erosion and rivers. We manage three quarters of all land outside the ice sheets. Greenhouse gas levels this high have not been seen for over one million years. Temperatures are increasing. We have made a hole in the ozone layer. We are losing biodiversity. Many of the world's deltas are sinking due to damming, mining and other causes. Sea level is rising. Ocean acidification is a real threat. We are altering Earth's natural cycles. We have entered the Anthropocene, a new geological epoch dominated by humanity. This relentless pressure on our planet risks unprecedented destabilization. But our creativity, energy and industry offer hope. We have shaped our past, we are shaping our present. We can shape our future. You and I are part of this story. We are the first generation to realize this new responsibility. As the population grows to 9 billion, we must find a safe operating space for humanity, for the sake of future generations. Welcome to the Anthropocene.
But as the credits for the animation go up there, you'll see that it was developed by the International Geosphere Biosphere Program, which is an interdisciplinary science program based at the Swedish Academy of Science. And the animation was shown in the opening of the Rio Plus 20 conference back in 2012. I find it quite useful because it helps us share an understanding of the constellation of challenges that we face. And importantly, it also finishes with a positive message that we can uh, change the world for the better. So it's in the context uh, of the Anthropocene that Richard Horton, the editor in chief of the Lancet Medical Journal, uh, established a commission on planetary health back in 2014 uh, with financial support from the Rockefeller Foundation. I was uh, greatly honored to be one of the commissioners uh, on that work. Uh, I, at the time, uh, as Catherine said, I was uh, directing the Global Health Institute for United Nations University. This uh, here at the top of the slide, this is the title of the report uh, that we produced and published in 2015, Safeguarding Human Health in the Anthropocene Epoch. You can see here a list uh, of the commissioners and the commissioners weren't all medical doctors like me. Uh, we came from various parts of the world and a range of different disciplines. Uh, there were economists, uh, environmental scientists, political scientists, among others. And importantly, the work we did uh, built on other work, uh, including the Brundtland Commission. Uh, here's a picture of uh, Dr. Gro Brundtland and the report uh, of the commission that she chaired back in uh, the mid 1980s. Uh, the report's called Our Common Future and the commission was the World Commission on Environment and Development. And uh, Dr. Brundtland originally trained as a medical doctor in Norway uh, before she went on to be Prime Minister of Norway uh, and later to chair this work for the UN. And um, towards the end of her career, she also led the World Health Organization uh, based in Geneva. And I think uh, the work that was done through this commission really popularized the term uh, sustainable development. It, it brought it into the mainstream. And it's notable uh, that Dr. Brundtland was a medical doctor by original training. So, so the whole idea of sustainability and sustainable development is ultimately about the health and well-being uh, of people, current and future generations, and indeed the health and well-being of all species on earth. So foundational work there uh, some three plus decades ago. But if we think historically, we can go further back. Uh, Hippocrates, uh, more than 2000 years ago uh, in ancient Greece, was writing books like this um, on airs, waters and places. So Hippocrates considered the father of medicine as it's currently practiced. He was talking to his patients. He was thinking about how they lived and where they lived and what those circumstances meant for their health and well-being. He was making ecological deductions about these relationships long before we had modern research techniques, modern toxicological techniques, for example. So uh, some of what we need to do as we look ahead is to reclaim these understandings uh, that have been with us uh, for millennia. And of course, uh, even further back, indigenous ways of understanding, indigenous ways of knowing, being and doing, as I mentioned uh, at the outset uh, today. Uh, Waiora is a Maori word uh, from New Zealand uh, for well-being and healthy waters. And it was the theme for a major conference on health promotion in Rotorua back in 2019, uh, the overarching theme, promoting planetary health and sustainable development for all. These understandings of the connection between the health of people and health of planet 
they might be a new idea in public policy uh, in universities, but it's not a new concept for Indigenous people. It's a foundational spiritual understanding and still informs uh, contemporary cultural practices uh, for people who are living close to country as Indigenous people, uh, many Indigenous people in Australia do. As it happens, uh, my family is Naitahu uh, Maori from the very south of New Zealand, and uh, it was a great pleasure for me to to be uh, the closing keynote speaker at that conference uh, back in 2019. When we think about these issues, we absolutely must think about demography and the human population. And here's some data on the population of the world in billions, uh, UN estimates. So on the left-hand side of the chart, uh, the purple bars, you can see there in 1950, uh, the total world population, about two and a half billion. Uh, and if you look through the projections through to 2030 uh, and the middle of the century, uh, we expect that the population of the world uh, will plateau perhaps around nine, perhaps 10 uh, billion people. But you can see from those purple bars, <laughs> excuse me, that through uh, this phase of human development, there's a seemingly inexorable increase in human population. This uh, chart also shows two important lines. The, the blue line is the number of people living in the countryside and the red line, uh, the number of people living in cities. And you can see uh, the back around 2011, we first passed the point where more people in, uh, across the world now live in cities than live in the countryside for the first time in human history. And for the foreseeable future, most population growth will in fact be in cities. And that brings challenges, but it also brings opportunities because we can do better in the way we design, develop and manage cities to be more sustainable. So that's the demographic story. But from a human health outcome point of view, we found in the commission that by almost any measure, human population is healthier now than ever before. So here, World Bank data, uh, life expectancy data, uh, on the left from 1960 uh, here through to 2010, and the black line in the middle of this chart, uh, the world average life expectancy. So you can see during that 50 year period, world average life expectancy uh, increased from the low 50s through the high 60s, and indeed now it's into the low 70s. And in fact, with all those lines on the chart, which are the World Bank regions of the world, you can see that across the world, uh, life expectancy has been increasing, but importantly, uh, inequitably, because uh, life expectancy in Africa and uh, South Central and West Asia uh, is much lower uh, than the world average. So health improving through this phase of development uh, unequally. But in achieving those health gains, we've exploited the planet at an unprecedented rate. And this is the data that we saw in that animation. Escalating carbon dioxide emissions, ocean acidification, energy use, global deforestation, water use, fertilizer use. The list could go on. And you'll see in these charts that there uh, was a big takeoff in much of this uh, from the mid uh, 20th century, around 1950. And uh, our, our science colleagues call this the great acceleration uh, in consumption. So what's planetary health? The definition we used uh, in that Lancet Commission work was that planetary health is the health of human civilization and the state of the natural systems on which it depends. Now, oh, just go back to this one. Um, we already know quite a bit about these relationships, the relationships between uh, the big environmental changes that we're seeing and human health outcomes. And here's some work from the Millennium Ecosystem Assessment back in 2005. So just walking you briefly through this, on the left here, escalating human pressures on the global environment, the Anthropocene, if you like, <laughs> excuse me. In the middle, 
a list of environmental changes and ecosystem impairments. Climate change, stratospheric ozone depletion, forest clearance, land, de land cover change, land degradation, desertification, wetland loss and damage, biodiversity loss, freshwater depletion and contamination, urbanization and its many effects, and damage to coral reefs and ecosystems. And then on the right-hand side here, three broad categories of health effects. The direct health effects that we saw in those pictures that I began with uh, today, uh, the health effects of fires, floods, heat waves. Straightforward, pretty clear that there's health harms from those extreme events. In the middle uh, here, the ecosystem-mediated health effects. Here we start thinking about altered infectious disease risk, reduced food yields in the context of environmental change, depletion of natural medicines, the mental health consequences of environmental change. And at the bottom here, the third category, potentially the most important category, the indirect deferred and displaced health effects. This is where we see interactions between these environmental determinants of health and uh, the social determinants of health. Uh, the health consequences from loss of livelihoods in the context of climate change, for example, uh, from population displacement, uh, people needing to leave where they live if they're being inundated, perhaps in a low-lying uh, island state or a, a large delta city uh, like Dhaka in Bangladesh, for example. So a lot going on here, but these kinds of schemas can help us keep the spectrum of challenges we're facing in view. Just drilling into key in the Lancet Commission deaths the world. Uh, every year, more than a million deaths uh, from particulates, more than 4 million from household air pollution, uh, more than 5 million in total around the world. And then if we look, drill into that data on air pollution deaths and look at average annual uh, global mortality for this 10-year period, uh, 1997 to 2006, due to landscape fire smoke specifically. We can see here on this map uh, two regions of the world really lighting up, uh, Southeast Asia and Sub-Saharan Africa. And you can see thousands of unnecessary deaths uh, from landscape fire smoke. And uh, uh, many of you would know uh, that fire is being used in these parts of the world to clear land cheaply uh, for, for example, to clear forests so that we can establish uh, oil palm plantations or perhaps um, for soya bean growing and the raising of beef, for example. So uh, this intersection between land use change and uh, human health. And then starting to look further at the multiple interactions uh, that we face here, if we're thinking about food availability and quality. Yes, it's climate change with its temperature and extreme weather effects, carbon dioxide fertilization with its effects on food quality, uh, pest molds and fungi in the context of climate change. It's also land degradation and soil erosion. It's water scarcity for other reasons loss of pollinators, an increasing issue around the world, overfishing and ocean acidification. We've got to think about these intersecting challenges. And then emerging diseases, which have preoccupied us uh, for the last three years with the COVID-19 pandemic. But that's just the latest in the story of emerging diseases. We can think about H5N1 and SARS uh, in the last 20 years uh, in the Asian region. We can think about Ebola in West Africa, uh, HIV, in fact, decades ago. Uh, we can think about Zika in the Americas more recently. These spillovers of novel uh, pathogens like the coronavirus that we've been confronting, these spillovers occur in the context of environmental and social change, whether that's climate change combined with uh, rapid urbanization, for example, the clearing of forests, meaning that habitat is lost 
wild animals come closer to domestic animals and people seeking food, and we get the spillover of these novel pathogens. This is combined with changes in animal husbandry, where we're seeing perhaps uh, further use of antibiotics um, in the food supply chain uh, as a way of promoting growth among uh, animals uh, so that they uh, can be reared faster uh, for market. And we're concerned about antibiotic resistance uh, in this context. So a lot going on here when we're thinking about these novel infections. But in that commission report back in 2015, about half of the report, uh, it's 50 pages in total, 20 or so pages, was about getting on with the job of doing something about it. Because we know a lot of what needs to be done. We really need to act. So in the field where I work, uh, developing sustainable and healthy cities, we can be thinking about active travel, public transport, reducing that fine particulate air pollution. We can think about green spaces, biodiversity in cities, reducing the urban heat island, uh, the mental health benefits of contact with nature in cities, watershed conservation, access to healthy food in cities, including growing more food in cities, and increasing resilience to those extreme events. We've been talking about the floods, the storms, and the droughts. So we know a lot about what needs to be done. We need to get on with the job of uh, planning uh, cities for people and planet. Similarly, in terms of future food requirements, here in this chart, uh, total global cereal production uh, from 1961 uh, through to the mid uh, 20 thousands there, but projected through to the middle of the century, you can see we're anticipating uh, a need for much more cereal in, in the years ahead uh, to feed people, but also to feed animals as we have a rising demand uh, for animal protein around the world. But you can see here on the left, multiple strategies uh, to uh, more sustainably increase food production, sustainably intensifying more efficient use of water and fertilizer, new approaches to aquaculture, supporting subsistence farmers, the list goes on there. Two at the bottom, really important for today, uh, changing our diets and redirecting land use back to food. If we shift to a plant-rich diet and reducing food waste. So I'll say a bit more about those now. In the commission, we found that nearly 30% of the world's total agricultural land is currently being used to produce food that's never eaten. In low-income countries, the food can spoil uh, before it even gets uh, to the table. Uh, perhaps uh, because of a lack of refrigeration or because of vermin, for example. In a high-income country like Ireland, uh, we are throwing away food from the table, uh, sometimes even uh, storing it in the fridge uh, for days and throwing it away directly from the fridge. Uh, this is a problem in high-income countries around the world. Um, so the food gets to people, uh, but some of it is not used. And if we if we tackled this food waste, reduced this 30% uh, food waste, uh, we would have more food to share around the world. And as the population continues to grow and demand for food increases, uh, we wouldn't necessarily uh, have to be clearing more land. So really important to grapple with that. And then the other part of the story, reducing greenhouse gas emissions and land use requirements from healthy diets, a plant-rich diet, better for our own health uh, individually uh, as people uh, and better for the planet. So lower risk of chronic diseases if we have a plant-rich diet and uh, a lighter footprint on the earth. And then forest conservation. Um, here, research in the Brazilian Amazon as an example. So forest conservation can reduce malaria transmission. Fewer vector breeding sites in this context, larger vector predator populations, microclimates inhibiting uh, anopheline mosquitoes, 
acute respiratory infections, the forest can filter those particulate pollutants, reducing fires, lower smoke pollution, reduce collection and burning of biomass fuel, and diarrheal disease, because the forests and the forest ecosystems help to reduce flooding and filter pathogens uh, from surface water. And then back to family planning and population. Uh, we found that more than 200 million women around the world who want to avoid pregnancy don't currently have access to effective contraception. And uh, that if we prov provided that family planning, we could cut maternal deaths around the world by about 30%. And on the right here, uh, meeting the need for modern contraception in low-income countries would only cost about $5 billion per annum, which in the scheme of global development budgets is a relatively modest amount of money. But of course, there are barriers to this, uh, religious barriers, political barriers um, in, in various parts of the world. And then the economy. Um, our current economy uh, is high consumption, wasteful, we need to rapidly transition uh, to a circular economy uh, where we focus on reuse, repair, um, uh, re recycling, redesign uh, to uh, reduce waste. In fact, perhaps uh, in a circular economy, we don't need to talk about waste anymore because we understand that it's all resources and resource flows and that the byproduct of one process can be an input into another process. So critical uh, that we rethink our economic models. So in conclusion with uh, the uh, commission, uh, we found that solutions do lie within reach. We know a lot of what needs to be done, but require a redefinition of prosperity. What does it mean uh, to lead a prosperous life? focusing on quality of life and improved health for all, together with respect for the integrity of natural systems. We identified three broad categories of challenges in this work. Firstly, what we might call conceptual challenges, failures of imagination, if you like. And here an example is the way we use a GDP, gross domestic product, as a way of measuring progress in many countries. And uh, many people now argue that we have to move beyond uh, GDP as a measure of progress to have genuine measures of progress, incorporating uh, the state of the environment and uh, human health and development uh, into these measures of progress. Secondly, uh, governance challenges. And you might call these failures of implementation. And a key one here is a failure to consider the future and our legacy on earth. And it's interesting to look at what's happening in Wales, for example, with their Wellbeing and Future Generations Act, other countries around the world, uh, thinking through how do we bring this uh, into our governance frameworks. And finally, um, speaking at a university today, of course, and uh, the research and information challenges that we face in this world, in, in this field. We, we might call these phase of knowledge. And certainly um, uh, we argued for what we might call transdisciplinary research. So yes, we need the academic expertise uh, in the various disciplines that universities offer, but we also need uh, the know-how of people who are working in policy organizations, people in practice, people doing business, uh, people in society. And uh, we call this a transdisciplinary approach because we're transcending academic disciplines and we're valuing the know-how of everyone in society, including uh, indigenous know-how, of course, as I said earlier. So here's a link uh, to the commission report. Uh, it's not just a 50 page report that many people don't have time to read these days. The shorter pieces of writing, uh, this video material and infographics, uh, and hopefully you'll find that useful.
Now, at the same time as uh, we were working on the commission, uh, many of us were also uh, helping to shape the UN Sustainable Development Goals, uh, which were agreed uh, by the member states of the UN in the same year that the commission came out. So I was, as I said, working for United Nations University, very much focused on goal three, good health and well-being, but also looking at the intersection with other goals. Uh, goal 11, for example, the city's goal. Uh, goal 13, the climate goal. Uh, goals 14 and 15, uh, life below water, life on land. And thinking about how all of these uh, goals, in fact, uh, are ultimately foundations for health and well-being. And that's, uh, this is the way that the World Health Organization uh, thinks about at the SDGs with human health and well-being at the center, uh, human health as an outcome of our development practices, uh, human health as an indicator of the sustainability of our development. So all 16 SDGs, all the other 16, we might think of them as uh, economic, um, social and environmental foundations of health and well-being. Now, uh, as I start to draw the threads together, I'd just like to say a bit about uh, the importance of human ecology as a way of understanding patterns of human health. Alongside epidemiology in research, education, policy and practice, we've heard a lot about epidemiology um, with the pandemic, of course, but let's not overlook human ecology and here I refer, for example, to the work of Stephen Boyden, the very eminent uh, human ecologist here, uh, one of his books, The Biology of Civilization, Understanding Human Culture as a Force in Nature. That's the Anthropocene, human culture as a force in nature. Stephen Boyden presents this conceptual framework for the total system that we are all part of, and I'm just going to walk you quickly through this because I think it's quite useful. So on the left-hand side here, you can see the cultural system, the, the cultural options. In box one, our, our worldview, what we know about, our beliefs, our priorities. This will inform the way we arrange our societies, the economic system we have, the government regulations we put in place, the education we offer. These are all options. We make decisions about those. What we end up with as cultural options will affect a range of biophysical options. The human population, I've spoken about this, the number of people, uh, the densities, the way they group together, are they in cities or the countryside, for example? The human activities that we undertake collectively, our fuels, are we burning fossil fuels? Or are we making energy renewably? How are we manufacturing? How are we farming? In box five, the human activities we do more as individuals, our lifestyles, our livelihoods, the way we travel around. In box six, the artifacts, uh, an ecological word for the things we make. We make buildings, roads, vehicles, machines. We develop gardens. Uh, all of these things are interacting. They depend on our worldview and our beliefs and what we value. And then on the right-hand side here, uh, the biophysical elements that are all uh, an interplay, the physical components, the atmosphere, ocean, clay and rocks, and the, all of the living components, plants, animals, microorganisms, the rest of the biosphere, if you like. So on the left, we've got human society, uh, in nested in the biosphere. And I think it's really important that we remember that we are all part of this. And the bottom line on this slide, that the health of humans, other animals and natural systems are emergent properties of the way this system works. And we intervene in this system every day. How do we intervene to optimize uh, for people and planet? Just taking this a bit further, thinking about human activities and then the research we might do uh, at a university uh, like Trinity, we, we think about relationships between the things people are doing and 
their health and well-being. We talk about behavioural risk factors, for example. We talk about social determinants of health, the things we're doing collectively. In health, though, human health, we often don't think so much about human activities and what those human activities mean for the health of the planet. Now, we've been talking today about the impact of changes to the health of the planet, like climate change, on the health of people. And our Canadian colleagues are now calling these ecological determinants of health. So social and ecological here you can see. And then the final uh, slide in this schema uh, with the arrows going in both directions, reminding us of the importance of systems thinking, understanding feedback, and why uh, we seem to be stuck uh, with many of these wicked problems. So this comes from Boyden as well. He calls it a biosensitivity triangle. Uh, here's a link uh, to another one of his books, and you can see the cover here on this slide. And um, uh, this is a quite a positive book. He Stephen wrote this uh, in his when he was already into his 90s uh, he's still alive and uh, still he's currently writing another book in the late 90s uh, this one called the bio narrative the story of life and hope for the future it is a hopeful book and, and you can download that um, uh, from that link so let me finish with this slide uh, so that was a bit of a gobful wasn't it all of that but so what what does it mean for the way we should be thinking about the health of people and health of planet, including at a university like Trinity? Firstly, we need what we might call an eco-social approach to health and well-being alongside biomedical approaches. We absolutely need biomedical understandings of health. We've greatly benefited from them in the control of the pandemic. But we also need this broader understanding of health in its ecological, economic, and social context. And we need to recognize that we have uh, a lot of things in play at once. We can't have the social determinants people in one corner, the people thinking about ecological determinants in another, and then economic over there. We have to be much more integrative in, in the work we do. Secondly, Systems thinking is critically important when you're talking about sustainability and sustainable development. And notably, it's critical to acknowledge the interdependence of all species on Earth. Not just uh, when we talk about biodiversity, we often think first about species we can see, iconic species. In Australia, perhaps the kangaroo and the koala, for example. But microorganisms are critically important too. Uh, and microbiological diversity needs more attention. Because to be here today enjoying uh, good health, we need trillions of good guy microorganisms on our mucosa uh, to help us be healthy. So we need to think about uh, systems in a variety of ways, all these interactions. Thirdly, intergenerational health equity. In a university like Trinity, there will be folks working on uh, tackling health inequities. Many, though, uh, will be principally paying attention to health inequities among people who are currently alive in the world or perhaps about to be born if they're working, for example, with uh, pregnant women. But it's less common uh, in contemporary universities to be thinking generations ahead of what's to come with health. As Indigenous people do, uh, in most Indigenous cultures, there's a tradition of thinking multiple generations ahead. And we have to bring the future into our conversation. We have to think about legacy. So intergenerational health equity uh, is a bit of a missing piece uh, of the puzzle here. And fourthly, Indigenous and local knowledge, uh, this transdisciplinary approach where we, we value different knowledge systems, different ways of understanding the world, and we value the know-how of local people grappling uh, with big challenges. And 
my final point today is perhaps a summative point that uh, we need to bring planetary consciousness into our everyday life and our socioeconomic and commercial systems. We need uh, to remind ourselves that we're part of nature. We need to be conscious of the planet in our decision making, not just uh, thinking about the needs of people. So uh, let me stop there and uh, and pass back uh, to Catherine uh, for the q and a. I'll stop sharing uh, now. Thank you so much, Tony. You've given us an extraordinary overview there, which has covered so many disparate topics, but you've brought together um, uh, beautifully. And um, we do have a few more minutes with Tony, uh, if people would like to ask uh, a question. Um, I'm going to take um, uh, Chair's prerogative though, Tony, and, and ask the first one, if that's okay. Um, one of the things that uh, we talk to the students about um, in our school, in the medical school is, what they can do uh, individually because quite often people can feel quite overwhelmed by this as a topic and and mm. I was struck by your comment around well what does it mean to live a sustainable life um, and I'm just wondering in terms of advice that you would give maybe at kind of the individual that that micro level choices say around food consumption but then meso and macro so you know, I think people, rather than feeling overwhelmed, they're looking to see how they can become activated in this space. So what would you advise people to do in terms of, of how best to live a sustainable life and, and, and to move from feeling overwhelmed and maybe stuck to, to taking more, more action? Yeah, no, look, thanks very much. A really important question, Catherine. And I certainly don't want to leave you uh, feeling overwhelmed and disempowered um, because I do think uh, that there is still a huge amount uh, that we can do. And some of that will be at the ind individual level. As you say, um, Catherine, those everyday decisions that we make. Now, some of these decisions are quite bounded by the options that we have, for example, uh, some people might um, be able to walk uh, uh, to the university campus if they live conveniently locally. Others might have access to a good public transport route or might be able to use a bicycle, but still others um, may uh, be quite car dependent, for example. So sometimes we, we're quite bounded uh, in our options, but it, it is important to be conscious of the things that we could do differently. Food choices, as you highlight, uh, another uh, good example there. Another thing I'd add is uh, finding your people, uh, coming together perhaps in your community, uh, with your neighbours, for example, uh, perhaps being part of a local community garden as a way of connecting and uh, and being empowered and, and sharing ideas. And the third thing to highlight, uh, which I think is particularly relevant in universities too, is thinking in the context of the course you're doing and what you might end up um, uh, working on in your working life. And um, uh, Catherine, you've mentioned that you you work in um, the health and medical uh, part of the university, and I know there's increasing attention uh, to reducing the environmental footprint of the healthcare that we deliver in our hospitals and our clinics, and um, and in fact, uh, uh, your part of the world are real leaders uh, in this area. Uh, certainly, the uh, uh, the the London folks um david pension a very dear friend of mine originally from cambridge he he really helped to activate things i think and it's taking off um across the greater european region of course but um and now around the world so uh, as a medical student perhaps or a nursing student or other students thinking about how you can apply these things in the context of your professional work is an is another good opportunity 
That's great, Tony. Some questions have come in now to the chat box, so I might just pick one or two for you to focus on. Um, one question is, uh, is, is human mental health improving in our cities? Well, it's yeah, that's a really good question. Uh, I think it's from Keith there. Yeah. And um, I think the first thing to say is that um, uh, when we look at cities and we look at aggregate numbers, and we track them over time, we often see trends uh, that uh, would be different if we disaggregated. So it's not going to be the same across all of Dublin. We're going to see uh, in certain parts of cities, when we disaggregate, uh, we're going to see uh, different trajectories uh, for health generally, uh, including uh, for mental health. And I know that. Um, certainly uh, here in Australia, and I expect it perhaps wasn't dissimilar uh, in, in Ireland, uh, the mental health uh, impacts of the pandemic and the pandemic control measures, importantly, uh, mm -hmm. particularly for young people uh, in our cities who had, who had a lot of things curtailed uh, for an extended period, um, perhaps educational opportunities, social opportunities, uh, opportunities to earn a living. And uh, so I, I think it, it's not possible for us to say that uh, mental health is is on an upswing. I would say, Keith, I, th I think we've got some headwinds uh, ahead. It's going to be time uh, uh, before we work through all of this. And I know there's a lot of concern um, uh, in many parts of the world for uh, the mental health of young people uh, in cities. And I, I think factors like that tend to be a dynamic um, construct that that can that can change. Uh, another question is, um, uh, Tony, could you elaborate a little bit more on the cause and link between the impact of uh, uh, issues on our environment and novel pathogens? Yeah, no, this is a really interesting one too. So uh, these uh, the, these spillovers of uh, novel pathogens uh, from uh, wild animals, perhaps bats, for example, uh, sometimes through domesticated animals to people. It's quite a dynamic process. And it is important to say that we don't fully understand uh, what's going on here. But it's at the heart of it is around opportunities for interaction uh, between wild animals, domestic animals and people. So some of that is about uh, how we live in proximity to animals. For example, in certain parts of the world, uh, people's animals might live under their house, for example, uh, which could potentially uh, pose some particular risks mm -hmm. uh, in, in that context. And the animal husbandry uh, practices uh, vary uh, across different parts of the world. One of the things that we're particularly concerned about from a sustainable development point of view is that as we um, remove habitat for wild animals, for example, if we clear a forest, the animals that have been living in that forest with an intact habitat have to look somewhere else for food. And it's likely that they'll go towards people often. There might be a developing edge of a city, for example. At the same time, changing climatic conditions might mean that food supply is no longer available for animals. So, so it's this combination of different environmental changes uh, that can lead to more opportunities uh, for contact between wild animals, domestic animals and people and promote uh, the spillover. It's, it's a really important area. It's, a, it's a, a, an area where we need more science. Thanks, Tony. Uh, a question from um, our health promotion officer, Martina Mullen in the chat box there. Um, uh, it's a, around the uh, using a lever such as legislation, uh, maybe to enact changes um, uh, more more broadly. And we've had some success here in Ireland, say around um, consumption of of you know wicked products like uh, smoking uh, tobacco. Is there any um, legislation that you're aware of that could be useful in terms of kind of healthy planet, healthy people that would prompt governments to limit some of the consumption of, of harmful products like tobacco, alcohol, ultra processed foods and so on. 
anything that you're aware of, maybe that's being used elsewhere that we could look to here in Ireland? Yeah, uh, this, this is a really interesting area because there's definitely uh, a role uh, for governments uh, in this context that, frankly, in the last few decades, um, uh, we've moved uh, to a slimmed down uh, government uh, in many parts of the world with uh, largely deregulated uh, commercial sector. And uh, some of you may know that uh, uh, I think it's uh, in the next day or so that The Lancet is going to be launching their new series on commercial uh, determinants of health. And this, it's relevant uh, to the food industry and the tobacco industry. And it's also, frankly, relevant uh, to the fossil fuel industry. And uh, uh, we're going to need uh, uh, more regulation uh, in this context uh, if we are to accelerate uh, uh, the change we need. Uh, some countries are doing better than others. I think, uh, sadly, uh, uh, many of the Anglophone countries, like where I live here in Australia, we've kind of let things get away from us in terms of uh, reducing the regulation. And so we're going to have to have that pendulum uh, swing back again. Very good. I'm conscious of time now, so I'll probably just um, pick one other question that I've seen come in. Um, this, I think, is, is quite pertinent. Uh, you were making a, a very strong call to action at the end around intergenerational health equity. So one of the, the questions in the chat box is, you know, is there any examples that you're aware of where that's been done well that we could perhaps use as a model? Yeah, it's I would say for most of us, um, uh, this is early days. I think um, uh, I, I mentioned um, uh, indigenous approaches um, to thinking generations ahead, and it would definitely be worth looking uh, at some of the experience there. And uh, uh, the countries that are starting to think about uh, well-being measures uh, are probably on the whole at the forefront. I'm not sure where Ireland's up to there. I think you are one of the countries that's starting to think about uh, governance for well-being. And if well-being can be framed as well-being of people and planet, and we can also think it's not just the well-being of the people who are of voting age at the moment, it's the well-being of all people and coming generations, then, then we're starting to get a better frame uh, for all of the decisions we make in our parliaments, for example. This is what um, Wales has been striving to do uh, with uh, the Wellbeing of Future Generations Act there, but it, m countries are taking different approaches. But I think that uh, that seems to be one pathway uh, forward. And I'm pleased to say that the new Australian government, there was a change of government here last year, is beginning to take this approach. We've had a, a, a few decades that uh, our governments uh, haven't been paying attention to this. Thank you so much, Tony. Thank you for being so generous with your time and um, a fantastic presentation so clearly articulated um, and I think there's takeaways for all of us as individual citizens of the globe but also as people maybe who are in practice or people in education uh, as well so um, we're grateful for your time thanks to everybody joining the webinar we do have some upcoming um, events uh, I think Katie has posted um, a, a couple of links there in the chat box as well if people would like to register for um, some of our future uh, events around uh, uh, Green Week and our sustainability initiatives um, here in Trinity. We would love to have you back again. Uh, we have recorded this. So, um, Katie, if, if we're able to make this available to delegates, that would be great. If people want to go back and reflect on um, some of the points that Tony made, that can be very useful. Thank you, everybody, and have a, a great rest of the day. Bye bye. Thanks very much. Cheers. Bye. -bye. bye.